The stark reality we are watching COVID-19 ravage New York City and those other hot spots all over the country. Good evening, I'm Amy Wood. Our families here in the Carolinas and Georgia are hurting too. Tonight, we're bringing you some of the most memorable local stories of this coronavirus crisis, stories of hope and healing. And we begin with Alexis Sprogus, who lost her father March 29th. Bravely, the very next day, she spoke to me to tell his story, to try to convince all of us to stay home. It's completely surreal, um, just knowing this morning, waking up, that I don't have my dad. Yeah. It's so hard. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who's walked through any kind of sudden loss of a parent, like in a short period of time, like Monday, your parents here, Friday, your parent isn't, is hearts are going out to you. Because if you've never walked the walk of losing a parent, it is devastating. And you had to not only, you know, handle that and not be able to be there, right? You couldn't be in the room with him, could you? I got to spend about 45 minutes with him um, with PPE and all sorts of, you know, equipment. Um, I was able to spend that time with him before they extubated him. Once they extubated him, I could only be outside of the room, um, separated by glass. Um, he was by himself the nurse wasn't there um and watch my dad die knowing that i couldn't touch him or hold his hand because of the particles that are released after you're extubated um so yeah not how i expected to lose my dad no ma'am i'm so sorry um, you sent us a picture of what you actually had to be wearing for that last visit, which is amazing to even comprehend. Say, you know, we've unfortunately so many of us have walked that walk, but at least we could be right there, you know, face mm -hmm. to face, and and that, all that gear on you, um, just a, it's another whole level of burden for someone who's walking this terrible experience. Mm -hmm. What, what do you have in terms of advice for other families who are going through this? What do you, what do you want them to know um, to prepare themselves for? And, and in terms of people who are out there and not dealing with this yet, which is the majority of us, to mm -hmm. keep it from happening to them. Like, what do, you, what, do you want, what do you want to tell people? I mean, I think, um, I think it, when you lose a family member to COVID, there are so many um, precautions you have to take to be with them. Um, I had to be by myself. Um, and like I said, separated from him by glass. I didn't get to touch him like skin to, to skin. I had to wear gloves. I had to suit up in all of the PPE, which I'm so thankful because I know that there's a shortage of that. So I'm thankful that they, you know, allowed me to at least have that <clears throat> in those final moments with him. But you know, I just think people need to realize that this is going to be a reality for so many of us. You know, my dad's story is going to be the story of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people um, before this is over. If people don't start taking social distancing and staying at home seriously. Um, yes, it, it doesn't affect young people the way that it does old people, but older people are our parents, mm, you know, our, and our grand, my children don't have a grandfather anymore. I don't have a father anymore, um, because of this. And I'm thankful that I could be with him at least in some part in those final moments. And he, you know, he got to FaceTime my sister okay. in Wyoming, um, I mean, he was ventilated the whole time, but she got that closure um, and she wasn't able to be here because of the travel restrictions sure. um, as far as airfare and how quickly he declined. That just mm -hmm. wasn't an option. Um, but like I said, so many people are getting ready to go through this um, by themselves, mm -hmm. family members who are, are reeling from the loss of their loved ones and their loved ones are going to die alone, alone. Yeah. My dad died alone. I'm so sorry. I just want people to take it seriously. I want, 
I, my dad made such a difference <clears throat> in his life. And I think he would be so proud to know that he made a difference to at least someone in his death. If it makes one reconsider what they're doing, it's all worth it to me. I have it's a picture up of your of you you on your daddy's shoulders <laughs> as a little girl. Yeah. And him hugging you when I guess that was your wedding, right? With that fantastic picture of you guys hugging. Yeah. And my dad had survived so much. He, um, right after I got married, so when I was at my wedding, he was in liver failure. Um, wow. And sh shortly after I got married, he had a liver transplant. Uh, and that was 13 years ago. Yeah. I mean, he was a survivor. He was a fighter. And this killed him. I'm so sorry, Alexis. How old was your daddy? He was going to be 74 next month. Wow. And on top of all of this happening so fast and the distance you had to keep at the end, you had to wake up this morning and tell his granddaughters about this. I did. I did. But my girls have so many good memories of him. And they're so good. They're so compassionate. They were more worried about, you know, him and me. And it, they're just good girls. And I'm sure he adored them he and did. spoiled them. Oh, he loved all of his grandkids. He had five of them total. And he loved all of them. You also share with me this fantastic picture. I guess you guys had all gone out uh, to the Dakotas. Mm -hmm. um, and when was that? And tell me about that. That was last summer. Um, he actually went out there to be with my grandmother. We thought that we were going to lose her. She's 95. Um, she pulled through, but he got to be there with my sister and his grandkids by her. And it was so good for him. I'm so glad. He loved his hometown. Alexis's dad spent decades as a drug and alcohol rehabilitation counselor. Her family now has to wait to have that special service in his hometown because of social distancing. Now, this is the heartbreaking reality for so many people right now in South Carolina. 67 families have now walked this walk. In North Carolina, 65. In Georgia, 379 families. As we continue tonight, we are going to focus in on the hope that's found in our people. From the artists to your neighbors praying on a hospital parking deck to show healthcare workers they care. Jesus, you are our healer, the great physician. And up next, a story of survival. It was kind of scary when you see all these people masking up to come in and check on you. 24 days after COVID-19 attacked Ron Kendrick, he's able to explain what it takes to fight for your life.
Ron Kendrick doesn't really know how he got it. He'd hit the grocery store, church, normal stuff. Two days later, the fever started and it didn't let up. Uh, yeah, isolation part, being around nobody, that was very hard. But uh, the fever and the breathing problems, it just got to me after a while. I, at one point, they thought they were going to put me on a respirator, but I made it through with just oxygen. I'm still on oxygen for my lungs because it drops below 90 if I don't have it. So, but yeah, it was, it was scary. But then and at the same time, I was away from my family and that, that really tears you up. I know it. It has to. What, what did you do to get you through those moments and those times? Ron, because that, that is a, a lonely, um, self-reflecting time, I'm sure. First three days, I didn't have my cell phone. Mm. Then my wife got it up to, her, to me, so I started FaceTiming her, and our pastors keep putting sermons and little teaching things online, so I watched them, and then my wife puts videos online of her singing, yeah. so I yeah. used all that to get through, and it was, it was pretty boring, but the staff at uh and nurses and doctors at uh pavilion six at regional they were just wonderful i mean they they were there for everything you need they just treated me so nice and it was kind of scary when you see all these people masking up to come in and check on you you know so and i just thank god that i've gone through it because the alternative was a uh, respirator or death and Thank God I don't have to do that. And you are wearing oxygen. Talk a little bit about what they've been able to tell you. Do they even know? Will Will that be something that lasts? Or do, you, do they know if it's permanent lung damage? What do they know? We don't know yet. I'm just using a bunch of inhalers and keeping this on, of course. And then I got sleep apnea, which makes it rough trying to wear a mask while you're coughing. So, yeah. it. but I'm getting through it. And... I had a little fever last night and I got a little concerned, but it's gone this morning. So, and then I check in with my doctor tomorrow with a video appointment. What, what do you say to people who are worried about getting this? And, and maybe some of the people out there who are still getting together with friends and not really listening to what the governor is saying. Stay, stay away. I mean, it just takes one cough, one sneeze and you got it. And you know, it, it's scary. And you see the death toll keep rising and rising because we really don't have a handle on this yet and, or a set way to treat. My doc, one of my doctors told me, he said, you're pretty well a guinea pig because we don't know what to try because they kept running different antibiotics, different medicines. They said, basically everybody who's getting it right now are guinea pigs trying to figure out what works best for this virus. And when it comes to the treatment and, and what you went through, like when you talk about breathing problems, can you describe that? Like, what was that like? Gasping for air, I would breathe very hard and just really hurt my chest trying to breathe because at one point my oxygen level got down to 83. So they had to put me on like four liters of oxygen to get me back up to about 92. So. But if I take this off, it drops below 90 and I can feel it because I have to hurry and take a shower when I take it off because I got to hurry and get it back on. But this, that breathing part's scary. It's very scary because you, what, <laughs> it's cumbersome to carry it around, but at the same time, <laughs> I need it. <laughs> so. Yeah, you feel better with it than without it, right? Yeah. Yes. And, the, and the alternative of not being here versus having oxygen on right now this is the way better alternative, right? Way, way better. I'm hoping tomorrow they say I can venture out of my room with a mask. We'll see. So, so you're still isolated. I'm still isolated in my bedroom and bathroom. So my wife sits meals on the table outside the door and then walks away for me to get them. Bless her. So, <laughs> yeah, she's got her hands full. And so this is day 24 and you're still isolated? Yes. The doctor told me I, it could be over a month, so. Wow. Yeah. What do they consider your case? Severe, critical? I mean, at the time you were in the hospital, I'm assuming it was- It was severe. Critical. Yeah, it was cri 
critical, severe borderline critical. Because yeah. like I said, they were debating whether or not to put me on a vent. And that was pretty scary when they told me that. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to go on push the oxygen up or something. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to, I want to do it on my own. So, yeah. Yeah. so I made it through and then they were going to send me home one day, but then they had three patients up there. They, what I heard, there was seven of us all together up there at regional and three of them had to go on the vent that not that day that I was going to go home. So the doctor kept me one more day just to make sure that I wasn't going to, take a turn for the worse. Right. He said he literally right. just walked out of the room and turned around and had to go back in because their breathing just went downhill that quick. Wow. Ron had hoped to emerge from isolation yesterday. That would have been day 25. Here I want to show you, you see him with his wife, Mary, and their special needs son, Nick, when they could be together. But unfortunately, the doctor told Ron yesterday he needs to continue to isolate until Saturday. That will be day 27. He's asking for prayers from all of you that his lungs will eventually heal. While the state of South Carolina does not track recovery and how things turn out for patients here, there are worldwide trackers that offer us some hope. Currently, according to Johns Hopkins University, over 320,000 people like Ron have recovered from COVID-19. When we come back, art that honors our healthcare heroes. Plus, how some of our nurses are headed to New York to help that hotspot. I'm really at peace with it. I feel like it's something that you're called to do. Um, we're called to help others.
Health care workers are hearing the call and they're responding like firefighters on 9-11. Tina Fowler is one of them. She's a nurse practitioner from Union and she's headed north. I really feel like the biggest need right now is in New York, and so that's why I chose to go there. And, and talk about that choice, right? Because we, we've heard a lot of people talking about this is going to be our 9-11 week. This is going to be a devastating experience. Mm -hmm. um, and here you are, just like at 9-11 when the firefighters were running into buildings, you're running right into the middle of the heat of this thing. Well, you know, somebody's got to do it. The providers that are there, the nurses that are there, the staff that's there, they're tired and they need some relief. And so if, if someone is available and I am available, um, then I think that's something we need to do. Now, we need people on the front lines here, too, because I think we haven't seen the big picture here yet. Um, and it appears that we're going to see more and more. Tina arrived in New York last night. She thought she was going to be working in the tents in the parks, but once she got there, she's been told there's an urgent call for help at Mount Sinai Hospital. And so she's there right now on the front lines of this COVID-19 battle. It's my love letter to those out there on the front lines, if you will. Next, art that honors those like Tina battling on the front lines. Worry, it can paralyze you or it can power you. For artist Rick Standridge in Greenville, it didn't take him long to figure out what to express about this very uncertain time. He calls this work Masked Angels. And then so it's the first responders. Who are the ones who have taken the hits that have the unprecedented uh, uh, tenacity and the fortitude to, to get in those foxholes take the hits for us, Amy, risking life, literally life and limb to, for their families and then also for themselves, for us, to, check, to, to, to make sure that we're uh, okay or 
to, if, if we're not okay, then to take care of us. And that goes for the firemen, policemen, those, the lab technicians that are in there and the Petri dishes right now. I mean, it's, it, it, it goes, it's, it's phenomenal. Indeed, there are many heroes, the helpers, from your grocery store to the intensive care units. We cannot thank you enough. And we thank you for trusting 7 News to cover the coronavirus crisis and to bring you these stories of hope and healing. It is our honor to stay connected with you during this difficult time. We will get through this together. We are the strong ones, stronger together. This is a time for rising up. And we're stronger, stronger together.